Why nuclear energy? Especially after what happened in Japan. And why melting salt reactor? And why thorium? And last but not the least, why China is the first one to eat the crap? That's Chinese saying. I mean, so I tend to give you explanation for two of them. I mean, why nuclear energy in China? But I would like, very much like to leave why melting salt reactor, why thorium with the conference. Uh, we have uh, so many experts around the world to have a discussion on that topic. My name is Mie Hen Jiang. I'm currently the president of Shanghai branch, Chinese Academy of Sciences. I used to be the vice president of Chinese Academy of Sciences in Beijing for 12 years and responsible for the technology related research and the development. Then I'm also in charge of the TMSR project in China, uh, which is a pioneer initiative of Chinese Academy of Sciences dealing with the thorium fuel cycle and uh, molten salt reactor from within the Academy of Sciences. In national labs, we have uh, roughly 50,000 staff and uh, employees basically composed of researchers, professors, and technicians, and so on and so forth. And at the same time, we also offer 50,000 graduate students PhD degrees and a master degrees. And the Shanghai Institute of Applied Physics is one of them, affiliated with the academy. And the institute is focused on nuclear science and technology. And recently, the Academy of Sciences launched a, initial, a pioneer initial program. It's called Thorium Melton Salt Reactor Project, 100% financed by our central government. China, as of today, is the second largest economy in the world. And in the next few decades, China will add even more GDP in the world economy. But however, China is still in the stage of its urbanization processes. As you can see from the chart, the urbanization rate of China is only 40 some percent. What in the US is almost 99 percent. And even in Korea, it's more than 90 percent. So that's the given. I mean, even we are the second largest economy in the world, but we are still in the stage of the urbanization evolution of processes. On the other hand, that has something to do with the urbanization, which means that China's economy is still in the stage of industrialization. If you can see from this chart, our GDP composition, the 45 to 50 percent of our economy is related to the industry. I mean, the traditional industry. Uh, but in terms of the energy per capita, China, if you compare with Japan and the US, US is right here, and Japan is right here and per capita usage of the energy in China is way, still way below what U.S. and the Japan consumed. We are still in the stage of the urbanization at the ratio of 40 some percent, which given rise to a huge demand for the materials. And you can see here, that is the turning point so from then on, the requirement, the need, the demand for the raw materials, for example, in this case, is copper, which is a commodity which China does not have enough supply, will turn to be a exponentially high 
requirement or demand, which we have to import from either Australia or Chile or someone else other than China. So that gives us a energy security issue. We can only supply domestically that much energy, but we have a huge gap. We rely on outside China, or we can develop ourselves if we can find a way to do that. The coal is still a major uh, energy for China, and this is the oil, and this is natural gas, and this is what we call renewable energy, including hydro, wind, and uh, nuclear. And I must say, among this segment, the hydro is the major part of it. Part of it. It's not a nuclear at all. How do we meet this gap? It's a huge challenge for China. To 2030, for US, the rely on the import of oil is, accounts for like 50% of their domestic demand. But China is going to be 75%. 75% is it's, it's a scare, very scary number, right? And for the natural gas, U.S., by 2030, it's pretty much independent. But for the European countries, you also have a very security issue, energy security issue here. For oil, there's much higher dependence on the foreign import, and even for the gas. And plus, recently, the U.S. announces that they have a largest reserve of the shale gas. They almost, you know, they can export oil or gas. So in our situation, China, by 2030, we end up with the scenario that we need a lot. We rely on a lot on foreign import of our energy. So another thing is about the climate change. So this is a picture, Copenhagen Climate Summit. China made a commitment at that meeting that the unit GDP energy consumption will be reduced by 40 to 45 percent compared to 2005 level of China. The non-fossil energy accounts for 15 percent of primary energy by 2020. And currently, it's less than, if I remember correctly, 5 percent. This is a Another issue that people talk about many years ago, but all of a sudden, we don't hear that talk anymore. I don't know why, but China made a commitment anyway. So in about less than 20, 10 years, our energy consumption intensity got to be reduced tremendously, and plus, we have to rely on a substantial part of the energy composed of renewable energy. So this is the Beijing look like when I grew up there 30 some years ago. And this is today. So that's why after 12 years in Beijing, I moved back to Shanghai. <laughs> Part of a reason. And if you look at the UK, this is today. So I must say, for 2008 Olympic Games in Beijing, we made an extra special effort to make the sky look like that for a very short period of time. <laughs> but we are so impressed with London last Olympic. Congratulations. So that's why we need to worry about our air pollution for our own sake, not quite for the IPCC report. People always talk about China's consumption of energy and the emission of the CO2 
as the largest quantity of the world. But I would add something here. Uh, as we can see from this chart, uh, this is the GDP of the U.S. and this is the input, this is the export of the U.S. and this is China's GDP for last, for I would say for last year, okay? I, I forgot to put the year on it. Uh, you can see from this chart, China export more than import, which means the export is more energy consumed, but in, we import the goods, which is less energy consumed. So in that regard, the consumption of the energy in China is not, not, not totally for China, but for the, for the world. But in, in U.S., they import more than their export, which means they import more goods which made up more energy consum consumed. So which means the U.S., not only per capita wise the, the highest energy consumption country, but also the advantage of other country to make import the goods, which is more cons energy consumed in other country rather than in the U.S. So that's why if you look at here, so this is the U.S., the per capita energy consumption right here. In China, even the second largest economy in the world, we are still way below what U.S. consumed and Japan consumed. And uh, even more than on that is the U.S. transportation plus residential per capita is much higher than Chinese transportation and residential per, cap per capita energy consumption here. So which means a lot of the energy used here in China is not for consume, it's for production. So given the situation I just described, China is in the urbanization stage. China is still in the industrialization processes. So those kind of scenario requires a high density energy. And to be honest, given the land size that we have, divided by the population, 1.4 billion, so land is a scarce resource for China. So we need a high density energy. Here, the photovoltaic, something right here, and the coal, oil, I thought, I think nuclear must be somewhere here. So that is why we need nuclear energy. Of course, China also is a rich solar country. Most of them in the west part of China uh, coincidentally in that area we have a lot desert which growing nothing but sunshine probably we can turn that area into a solar, a solar factory probably very true in, in the future uh, if we take a look at the global solar install capacity the total for 2011 the total solar capacity installed is like 70 gigawatts. Uh, the total capacity of the production worldwide is 60 gigawatts. And China accounts for 60% of it. So the 40 gigawatts production capability capacity is in China. For those installation, Germany is a typical example that they already accounts for almost 20% of their electricity. Germany has been successfully deploying the solar electricity to compensate the valley and the peak. So if you take that into the consideration, the electricity generated by, fo by, by, by photovoltaic or by solar in general in Germany accounts for almost 40% which is a proven fact that solar can do something really. But 
In China, we install only less than 1% of our electricity. When I present this figure, I just want to say, in terms of the solar, I will say even this is the downturn, a very slow time for, for solar industry, but I will, I will believe that solar still has a bright future uh, in, in, in many places. And solar is nuclear energy anyway. Uh, so in that regard, we still go back to the nuclear energy. And uh, is there a harbor peak? There's a lot of talk about harbor peak. And are we here? People say we are already over past the harbor peak. And someone say we never get the harbor peak. But in any case, solar is the nuclear energy. So we can take advantage of it. And why I showed this uh, picture? Because the AP1000 is also called the third generation nuclear reactor technology. Was the first one to eat the crap, I mean China. Um, they've been talking about the AP1000 back in 2005. The technology was developed by Westinghouse at that time, a U.S. company, and later on, changed the owner to Toshiba Japan. And when China and the Westinghouse was negotiating, was talking about the deployment of the AP-1000, there was no one in the U.S. deployed that technology. I was visiting the DOE at that time. I actually was asking a specific question, why U.S. did not? apply this technology in the U.S.? The answer was vigorous. But to the end, we, China, actually signed a contract with Westinghouse uh, in 2007. So we start to negotiate, and the project finally kicked off two years ago. So uh, recently, U.S. also approved another four units of AP-1000 in Georgia, Georgia State. Uh, that's, the, that's the new nuclear power station project ever been approved since three miles accident. So which is a good sign. Uh, uh, even more important, the improvement was given after the Japan's accident. As I said previously, China made a commitment by 2020, the renewable energy it has to be accounts for 15 percent of the primary energy. So how how do we do that? I think one of the major action. Now we talk about the action. The Chinese government has taken is to have a more nuclear power station install, inst installment in China. So by 2020, we are supposed to have a 70 gigawatts. Currently, we have a 10 gigawatts, and and here. It, just in this single site, we'll have a six units of 1.25 gigawatts uh, nuclear power station. So by 2015, we are supposed to have a 40 gigawatts, and by 2020, it's 70 gigawatts. The number after 2020 is even bigger, but I, 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 I doubt that will be reality. I don't know yet, but this is we can foreseeable that 40 gigawatts by 2050 is for sure, and the 2020 70 gigawatts we will see. So then the white thorium. Uh, I I I better leave this topic with the conference, but at least I think China has is the second largest reserve. In addition to that, the nuclear fuel cycle. Uh, I quote this from a well-known uh, paper here. Uh, I, I personally uh, think that there is still an argument about whether the thorium can be burned that clean. But for sure, uranium cannot be that clean. I mean, the, the deep burning. So live with less fission elements and so on and so forth. Again, I will 
leave this with the conference. I'm sure you will have a more discussion on that topic. And why MSR? And this is the uh, chart uh, given by a, a, a U.S. colleagues. Uh, they would like to call FHR rather than the MSR. But I think it's, it's about the same thing. FHR stands for fluoride high temperature <coughs> reactor. And we call melting salt reactor. It, it's about the same. So we obviously the advantage of this is this is clear. We not only have a, 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 a low pressure here, which gives you more safety, we also end up with the high cool, cooling temperature here. And we, as far as energy is concerned, we need high temperature. Because nuclear power station not only generate the electricity, but we also can take advantage of the high temperature if you can go as high as 900 degrees C or even higher. Then we can use this energy to produce the hydrogen. Once we have the hydrogen, then we can convert the CO2, which is not the waste at all. Is a, is a raw material for our chemicals, in fact, if we can collect them. But we need the high temperature. In general, we need the energy to convert them. So that's what we call the hybrid energy system. We've already done many pilot projects, and some of them, some of them are already industrialized. For example, the Code 2 liquid fuel project, uh, we've been successfully uh, finish those projects. Uh, so those are not just a pilot plan, it's an industrialized scale plan. And the technology and the catalysts are all developed by the Chinese Academy of Sciences. Once we have the electricity generated by the nuclear power station, which is clean, then we hope that we can drive the car by electricity. Uh, I'm sure some of you have already seen this. In 1994, the state of California passed the law of the zero emissions. And GM's EV1 came out in 1996 because they want very much like to catch the market of the California. The big oils, but heavily lobbying East Coast, especially the New England area, not to follow the same track as California did. The big oil was successfully doing that. So finally, GM called back all the EV1s from the market and crashed them in 2004. It's, 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 it's something to me like, like, like World War II, NAS. It's amazing, it's, it's a very scary story here. So with the lesson like that, and what happened in China, uh, we used to have a dream, if we can produce a clean electricity, then we can drive our electrical car. Here is the total carbon fiber EV developed. It's, it's a pure electrical car developed by Chinese Academy of Sciences. However, if you look at this, as of today, the capacity of the production capability in China is over that of the United States. We have a 20 million units production capacity. It's over the United States. So, the gasoline car here in China is everywhere. If you, if you look at this national holiday, right? It, it's all gasoline cars. So it makes our job even impossible to convert the gasoline car into the electrical car. So we also have our big oils here and our all GMs here. How do we overcome the difficulty 
the obstacle in front of us in order to push the green economy, again, we need a revolutionary something happen even in this part of the world. Oh, we have a dream. Finally, even the economy is globalized, but each country has its own security issue, like energy security issue. So we very much like to be an energy independent. Use nuclear or even solar to produce the electricity that we need. Then we can save the coal used to be used for the production of electricity to convert the coal into the chemicals that meet our normal needs. Then we can save the oil we have to import. So that gave us a possibility of the energy independence. And then we'll also at the same time give rise to a green economy. And at the same time, can create a lot new kind of jobs. For example, if the major two things I'm thinking of, if we can convert all the gasoline car into a EV cars, not to use the cover of the car, not to use stainless steel, but carbon fibers, then we can reduce tremendously the quantity of the input of the raw materials from country other than China. And another driving force will be high speed train. If we can build up a network of the high speed train nationwide, I mean, this kind of transition can in fact change the structure of the economy. And at the same time, we'll create more jobs for sure. We need that. And I wish the conference will give a good answer and solutions to the question why thorium and why molten salt reactor. I wish the conference a real success. Thank you.